I mean, I, I know that we're in the middle of a, of a legislative session. I understand we're in session. Uh, and so we're going to do our very best today to move this meeting on as quickly as we are able to, uh, to do so. Um, so, Brandy, how about call the roll? Hill, Here. Wadsworth, England, Here. Almond, Here. Bedsoul, Here. Chestnut, Faulkner, McClammy, Pettis, Robbins, Here. Simpson, Here. Standridge, Here. Starnes, Stringer, Tillman. Here. You got a cool. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Have you got that amendment for her bill? Where is it? Uh, excuse me, Senator, Senator Figures, would you want to do 316 for us, please, ma'am? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee of the House. It's good to be here, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for putting this bill on your agenda. This bill deals with uh, electronic battery powered devices capable of being used to deliver any e-liquid, e-liquid substitute, tobacco, CBD oil, THC oil, herbal extract or nicotine salt or any analog thereof or any other substance to the individual through the inhalation of vapor. And what this bill does is make it illegal for a minor under the age of 21 to have any of these type devices. Vaping is getting to an epidemic in the state of Alabama. And this bill, it, it really doesn't criminalize the, the, the person, but it gets the attention of the parents. And there is a slight fine. Uh, they will pay, which is already in the code, they will pay no more than $10 or up to $50, or no more than $50. But the judge still has the discretion as to whether or not they will pay that or not. But this bill is intended to get the attention of the parents so that we can get these children the help that they need. The school system and the, the superintendents and principals are telling me this is the number one problem they're having in our schools. So of course, you know, Representative Drummond's bill that passed the House overwhelmingly, HB 319, this will just complement that bill while we're trying to keep everybody safe. All right, let me ask you a question, okay, ma'am? And I, I, if you don't want me to do this, I won't, okay. all right? So we're, we're, I'm up to you. Okay. Your bill had absolutely zero punishment in it. It does. Well, no. it does. That's just the fine. Okay. That's just the fine. Now, what? Representative Drummond's bill is has the punishment in it, and it also allows the school systems to come up with their own policies okay. in order to attack this issue as well. And what I had thought, Senator, and, and again, it is on line 31, put in there someone who, who possessed this could be guilty of a Class B misdemeanor. Now, I'm gonna tell you, Senator, if you don't want that, I will not offer it. If you don't mind, I'd like to. But that's, well, that's I'd a, really like to keep it as it is, um, Mr. Chairman. And the reason is, is because we're really trying to get the attention. This bill is more of like an awareness bill showing how, what an epidemic this is becoming. We're, it's, it's, it's predicted that we're going to lose over 100 people, 100 children in the next 10 years if this continues to go on as it is. Which is why I really wanted the juvenile court involved. I'm not, well, I'm not fussing with your idea. Representative Drummond's bill does that. It does. You're yes, right. sir. Okay. All right. All right. Has anybody got any questions on Senator Figure's bill 316? I'll leave it alone, ma'am. Thank you. I, I do have one thing. Go ahead. It, is Representative Drummond's bill, what's the status of that in the Senate? We are trying to get it on the special order calendar now. There are many people working on that, Representative. Thank you. We're all for that bill. Yes, and I've told them that. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm about to make a motion, but I have an amendment for it. No, I'm going to leave it alone. Hey, if, Senator, if Senator Figures wants me to leave it alone, I'm going to leave that alone. Yes, sir. And this came out of the, the Drug Education Council, Virginia Guy, who's the executive director of Mobile. Mm -hmm. And she came before our committee. I, I think she's been before the committees here, too, maybe. 
I'm not, not on, sure. Not on this, ma'am, but I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying she Right. Has. Well, I mean, it, it, it's really a bad problem. Okay. Oh, yeah. I think so, too. Go ahead, Ms. Ms. Allen. Does this, you mentioned it complements Ms. Drummond's, Representative Drummond's bill. Does it conflict in any way? No. Okay. Not at all. And in fact, uh, Virginia Guy, the Executive Director of uh, Drug Education Council in Mobile, has, she is 100% behind both bills, and she asked me to handle this bill when she already knew and was well aware of every word in Representative Drummond's bill. Representative McClammy, did you have a question or a comment, either one? Just a quick comment. Go ahead. I just want to say thank you to you and also Representative Drummond for bringing awareness to this vaping epidemic that we have. Thank you. Especially with our young people, so I just yes. want to say thank you. Thank you. No more questions. I'll entertain a motion for a favorable report. So moved. Second. second. Thank you. There's a motion to second. Represent Senator Figures. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Senator Figures, you got a favorable report. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank we, you, Mr. Chairman, and thank lot. you, members of the committee. Senator Gavan, you got two. Would you, while you're up there, would you go ahead and hit 245 and 322? Just, we'll, you know, one at a time. Yes, sir. I'll save you the, the, the pain on the nonprofit one. That's the one that, uh, You've already passed for uh, Representative Wadsworth, and we passed in Senate Judiciary this morning. So unless y'all want to hear me talk about it. <laughs> Do you want us to give you a favorable report on it? That would be lovely. I All right. How about a motion for a favorable report on 245? <laughs> is there a second? Thank you. Any, any comment? This is, this is the UCC bill, isn't it? The nonprofit no, no, bill. Well, it's ALI bill. Yeah, ALI. A ALI did it. All right. All in favor of a favorable report on 245, say aye. Any opposed? Okay, thank you, Senator Gavan. What about uh, 213? So no, the notary, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, 322. So the notary bill uh, came from the probate judges, and uh, I worked on that a little bit before I turned it in. Um, we also got uh, uh, David Kimberly to work on that. Also, I sent it to a variety <coughs> of people, uh, sent it to several title company people, sent it to Jesse Evans. So we had different people make have a swipe at it, if you will, and because um, I wanted in, insight from a, a, a variety of people. We worked on it a fair amount. Had, I was really surprised how long it went in, in uh, Senate Judiciary because we went on for over over half an hour, I think, on it, and I wasn't expecting that when we went into it. Uh, the, the number of the um, uh, minority members had some great points, and I accommodated their concerns. Uh, in this. Uh, I'm not pretending this is a, a perfect bill, um, but um, but which we're trying to put some accountability in to the notary law uh, and put some training in there. One of the things we took out, members, is testing. There was a concern that that would limit the pool of available. Um, and there was also, candidly, some concern uh, from members of my caucus about, you know, rural Alabama having access to notaries. But, I mean, this is supposed to be a fairly simple, the, the plan is, is the ALI and the probate judges would come up with a training program. You'd sit on your computer. You wouldn't have to leave the office and you'd be able to, you know, you know get the training you need there, again, without a test now. Uh, but it just seems to me that we need to do some something to make this a little bit better. And we also left all of our RIN, all the, the uh, real estate lawyers in here certainly remember the drama we had about that, the remote ink notary a few years ago. That is left intact. Okay. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. I, I just have a comment. I was in that judiciary meeting where, where we had lots of discussion and, and got to hear a lot about the bill. I just wanted to say I think it's um, much needed. Just this this week I had a um, some discovery sent back to me that uh, where someone had notarized two signatures of people who had been dead for more than 50 years when they notarized the signatures and they, the response from the person was they didn't understand that that was a problem. So definitely education is needed, I think, of people who are allowed to be notaries just to cut down on things like that. So hey, thank if you've you. ever dealt with a notary that's, I, I have dealt with one that's been dead 50 years, but I've, I've dealt with some that obviously they didn't see them sign. And it's a, that's not right. And there needs to be. And we have a series of penalties in there here There needs for to be that. some accountability. Go ahead, Mr. Engel. I've also dealt with notaries that thought it was their responsibility to interpret what they were signing or, or what they were attesting to. 
Right. That's one of the things that uh, Senator Coleman Madison brought up is that people were trying to read into the body of it. It's none of their business. Yeah, and that's part of the education that we need to give. Yeah, just, just, just stamp the damn thing. That's what you're here for. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, <laughs> with, 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 all that, with all that being said, I, I, at the appropriate time, I've got a motion. <laughs> um, motion to give Bill a favorable report. So the fee now is, I think, ten. The ten dollars. I don't know. I my, I just renewed mine, and I handed a check to the probate judge, and I handed a check to the uh, insurance agent before I went. And right now, I mean, it's just that's all I did is I went in and I, you know, here's my uh, application, and then boom, I'm a notary public. But uh, one of the things to keep in mind is not just if we dealt with inflation since that's been there, but the probate judges will be doing a training program, and so that's part of the. The theory behind that that fee that came in there. So where does it go to? Is that it, goes to the probate judge. The fee does. The fee does. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Robbins. $5. From five dollars to hundred. Oh no, no, no! I'm sorry. The fee you can charge goes from five dollars to ten dollars. I thought you were talking about the filing fee. I misunderstood. No, the, I am. I'm talking about the filing fee. Yeah, so the filing fee went to a hundred dollars. It, it was not. It, it was. It was more than five. It was a notary can charge. Although I've been one for twenty nine years, I've never yet charged anybody a, a fee for notarizing. But you could charge someone five dollars, uh, and now that's gone to ten dollars. Uh, Senator Van, so will there be, so I know now when you do your notary, you just walk in and you hand it to the clerk, they just file it. Will there be an application process that will go on with this to say the, almost a checkbox on if you've, if you're in bankruptcy court, if you're in, you know, you know, if you're in bankruptcy court, if you've ever been convicted of a felony or crime of I guess is that what's going to happen? So that's what I anticipate is the Probate Judges Association will come up with a form that we're all signing. Hopefully it's going to be uniform and not different per county, but you would have a, you would have to check off on those things. They would have the right to do the, the background check. The one thing, and Senator Smitherman and I sat there on the, on the Senate floor, and we, we dealt a lot with or debated a lot about shall versus may. Uh, in terms of the granting of the uh, license. And we were going through the list and we were, everything was shall, shall, shall until we got down to the 30 day. Uh, well, we ended up putting a 30 day. That was sort of the compromise on the training because it may be that, you know, you, you, you want to, you know, like me, I always want to try to get my notary on a certain day to help me remember it. And um, and so it may be you don't have your training in place by then, but you can you would have 30 days unless good cause is shown to the probate judge to extend it. So would I mean, so right now we're raising the fee from ten dollars to one hundred dollars. So if the pro I mean, I guess the probate judges wrote this bill, but if you're putting this much more work on them where they're going to maybe do background checks and it's now on them instead of just accepting a paper is a hundred dollars sufficient you think i don't know but they didn't ask for any more so i don't, I don't have to give them any more but um but no I, it may not be but that again they were the ones that offered yeah. it up so yeah, they, exactly. they apparently felt strongly enough about the goals in trying to filter a little bit who i mean because i mean we're not trying to i mean this isn't a this isn't a high bar that we're, we're asking. So, uh, but they are going to, you're right, uh, Representative, they're going to take on extra duties uh, in investigating. And, and I, I, would, I would think do more than just do a, um, you know, take somebody's word for it. And will there be any penalty if you, if you lie on your form, if you have been convicted of a felony, but you still, let's say you've been convicted of a felony and you don't, disclose that when you get your notary will there be any penalty for for lying on i mean because oh, off the top of my head i do not recall i didn't see that either okay i've got a question uh is there as far as the being physically present when the when the notary is signed you know, when it's signed is there any exception to that or they just have to be physically present let's say zoom or anything to that effect we still we still have the remote ink notary exception where you can watch somebody on zoom or webex or facetime you just would have to keep that for seven years which is why i don't do it okay okay and what are the repercussions if somebody does not uh, <laughs> 
to the do as far as the document if somebody does not physically see them sign but they notarized anyway so if it's done with intent to defraud it's a felony uh, I think otherwise it's a misdemeanor as I recall I don't remember all the specific uh, uh, penalties in there we did go through I went through with David Kimberly and we kind of the, the probate judges had suggested something a little tougher and we did lower that down a little bit and I think we lowered one of them maybe to a D felony if I recall because my thoughts were is that we didn't really want to put somebody in jail for that necessarily but we you know we'd want to we didn't want to just give them a slap on the wrist either okay. thank you yes ma'am please Okay, I see where you increased um, the transaction for $5. Is there a maximum um, charge that a notary can charge? Because you go someplace and it's places and it's kind of outrageous. Well, that, their cost. that part of what I understood from talking to uh, Senator Coleman Madison and some others is that people were charging more than they were lawfully allowed to charge, and that's part of the reason for the education program and uh, testing that we would have. Well, not, well, I'm sorry, take it back. We took out the testing, uh, the, the uh, training that we would have to let people know they, they couldn't do that. And if they do, what happens? So again, I don't remember the penalty, but there's a there's a penalty built in there for for them doing that. So you're saying that the maximum they should call a charge is five dollars for a page. Now ten. Now I mean ten for a page. For for just and that's just notarizing somebody's name. But most of the time, it's like if somebody comes to me for a close and I don't charge them for I don't notarizing charge either, e anything. I, it's you know it's whatever it is whether it's by the hour or whether it's for a transaction flat fee i don't charge them for notarizing anything yeah i don't either but I, i've been to places and it's crazy what they're making thank you okay, interesting see, see, no more questions we have a motion a second to give this bill a favorable report all in favor please say aye. aye any opposed senator thank you a lot thank you very much senator barfoot how about 143. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, I will be as short as I can, but answer any questions that, that may, be, uh, may be asked. SB 143 uh, changed. Uh, we worked with uh, different parties uh, in the Senate to make it a more palatable bill uh, that still addresses and accomplishes what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, it passed the Senate 32 to nothing. Uh, some of the changes that we made were changing gangs to criminal enterprise. We made some other changes that uh, stripped out a Class D felony out of the bill. The bill that you see now is the bill, of course, that's passed, and there should be no uh, amendments or substitutions to that. Just three main things. Uh, that is, enhance uh, if someone is convicted of a crime, uh, again, beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, then um, and, and that is in the commission or... Uh, uh, to benefit as a as a criminal member of a criminal enterprise as defined in the statute, and uh, it uh, benefits that criminal enterprise organization. That C felony, for instance, becomes uh, sentenced like a B. So there's that enhancement on those crimes. Secondary to that, or in addition to that, there is if that uh, crime is committed and there is a uh, firearm that is possession uh, during the commission of that crime and that uh, crime benefits a criminal enterprise, there's a mandatory five-year consecutive sentence. If it's brandished, it's seven years. And if it's used during the commission of that crime, there's a mandatory 10-year enhancement, consecutive enhancement on that. So I'd be glad to answer any questions, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Senator. I was just going to say I appreciate all your hard work as a law enforcement officer in the state of Alabama. You know, this is something that's needed. I know that you, along with a lot of others, have put a lot of work into making this a good bill for our state. Uh, we are one of the few states that don't have legislation addressing this, so thank you for that. And at the appropriate time, I would move for a favorable report. Thank you. Yeah. Also, um, you know, I read the newspaper. Uh, this was a this was a tough one, um, and you know the way it started to where it is now. Uh, again, uh, represent to just what Representative Stringer said. Um, your willingness to to work through some of these issues and put together. Uh, I mean, it's a, a better piece of legislation. I thank just you. want to say thank you for that, and also thank you to the Attorney General's office because again, I know this was. 
the way it started to where it is now was a long way. So yeah. I appreciate your work on it. Thank you so much. Question. Thank you. I had a question. First of all, I thank you for the changes. This gave me heartburn. Right. Um, I do just want to make sure that I understand this definition of what constitutes a criminal enterprise, please. Tell me where you tell me where you're at on the I'm on page 245, two line forty five. Uh, I just want to make sure it's what I think it is. Yeah, and uh, and that language uh, I think is uh, used in um, other states, federal law, existing federal law, and then we already currently have that 13A6-26 into state law. It defines what a street gang is, and I believe that's been the law for years, a lot longer since I've been here. So. so I guess my question is this will also include terrorist organizations and stuff. Sure. Any, any individual or group that meets that definition, absolutely. And that was, and that was the reason. Quite honestly, we didn't have a, a problem changing it from gang to criminal enterprise because it is uh, all-encompassing. It should be, and we want to certainly protect the, the state of Alabama from folks who would commit crimes to do harm to benefit a criminal enterprise. Something that uh, is not just a one-off scenario, but uh, in an effort to to make sure that uh, you know we identify those individuals that uh, are in a criminal enterprise member who benefit that criminal enterprise system. And um, I think it's a, a valid change. Okay, so we can stop calling it the gang bill then. No, no it's a criminal enterprise bill. Thank you. Just uh, thank the senator for his hard work on this and uh, look forward to voting for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, many members. Senate Bill 213. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senate Bill 213 is a uh, bail bonds reform act bill. It goes back and addresses some of the issues that we found or discovered with the bail bonding act. It's going to allow. Uh, it's going to allow the bail bonding companies to attach filing fees to bail bonds at time of posting bail uh, in form of a payment. It's going to address uh, extending the response time for surveys from 28 to 30 days and hearing on forfeitures from 90 to 120 days. Um, a surety may sign may sign for a forfeiture with the check uh, with the clerk instead of a certified mail. And it's going to, with counties of population of 2,000 or better, 200,000 or better, new sh sureties in counties posted as escrow agreement into the amount of 50,000. Amount is currently 25,000. Uh, it's going to require a three year license requirement before ownership of a bail bonding company. Florida and Mississippi already have this in place. And at the appropriate time, I would ask for a favorable report. Uh, yes, I think there may be a friendly amendment. That is true. <laughs> that is true. Um, I have an amendment. Um, so the first part of the amendment is on lines 138 through 140 on page five. That is to restore the stricken language. Um, there it is. There you go. The stricken language is if there had been any adjudication of guilt or in cases where there had been adjudication of guilt. Uh, that would that language is restored back to the bill on lines 141 through 144 on page six what this would do it says issues any order of restitution and the underlying language would be stricken from the uh, definition on 
lines 154 through 155 on page six, uh, restore the stricken language. Uh, that language is for the failure to, of the defendant to appear at the time of the conditional judgment was entered. And then also on lines 261 through 264 on page 10, replace the language with the following article within 90 days of court's conditional forfeiture order to the defendant and sureties. The notice may be in the following form. And then on page uh, 12, line 314, re replace with the following after the order the court was set. And at this time, Mr. Chairman, I'd offer the amendment. That amendment's been offered. Is there a second? Second. All right. Then it's offered a second. Is there any discussion? And I, I'll tell you all this. I think most of these amendments were worked on by OPS and the Judges Association to, to get this bill in a situation where you know, they felt like it was manageable because obviously the judges and the DAs are the ones that deal with bonds more than anybody else in the system. So are those, are you okay? Yes, with sir, that? those are friendly amendments. All right, <clears throat> friendly amendment. All in favor of, of, of the amendment, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? So then, Mr. Stringer, it's back to you as amended. Uh, at the appropriate time, would I ask for a favorable report? It's appropriate time, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Standards. There's a motion and second to give the bill as amended a favorable report. Are there any other comments? All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? It's got it. Favorable report as amended. And Thank ladies you, and gentlemen, that does conclude the judiciary for the House for this, uh, this session. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate your help very, very much. Thanks, Shane. <laughs>